Hi folks, Mark and Gonzalo here from Maple Capital Partners, and we're here with another monthly installment of our educational newsletter. This month, we're going to be talking about the acquisition process in multifamily real estate. We feel that this is a super relevant time to go over this process since we're currently pursuing a deal, and this is a great opportunity to discuss some of the things that we're going through uh, as we get under contract and are on our way to close a deal. Great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so um, this portion is going to be going over uh, kind of like the first steps of this entire process. So the first step is really the underwriting process. Uh, we get a lot of deals in our inbox. We view a lot of uh, potential opportunities. But finally, when something really pencils out and it looks like it may be an opportunity that we may have to submit an LOI for, uh, we are very excited. We then move on to reviewing T12s, rent rolls for the property. And last but not least, if the uh, property does have available tours or unit walkthroughs, it's a good idea to maybe put your eyes on that property before you actually get that LOI out. In our case, since we invest out of state, uh, we have very good local partners in the market that we invest in. They are able to really visit the property, uh, put eyes on the property for us, document things with the broker as they're doing maybe a, a couple of unit walkthroughs, maybe a few of the vacant units. They can take a look at it, photos, and then take notes and forward those things over to us. That way we have a little bit more of a reassurance as to our underwriting. Again, this is a very initial stages of the LOI because, again, LOIs are non-binding contracts, but it gives us a good validation of our initial assumptions that we uh, think about when we go through the first steps of the underwriting. Absolutely. So once we've underwritten the deal, we've looked at the T12s, as Gonzalo mentioned, and the rent rolls, we've potentially had our local boots walk through the property, if not ourselves, then we'll put together an LOI. It's a letter of intent. That's a non-binding agreement that is before the contract step that basically lays out all the sticking points of a particular deal. It can detail things like the price, the closing timeline and due diligence period, the earnest money deposit. So that's the deposit you're going to put down to demonstrate that you are a real buyer. Uh, as well as financing clauses, any kind of contingencies that you'll build into the contract, and any other terms uh, that would set you apart from maybe other offers that are on the table. Once you've submitted the LOI, the broker and the seller will, will review those LOIs, and they may, if there are quite a few offers, they may invite you to a best and final round, and that's basically uh, a cue for you to sharpen your pencil and make an offer that's as competitive as possible. That step is going to be where they bring in maybe a few of the top offers uh, that are most likely to close. Uh, the broker will have you know, some opinion in terms of if you, if you have experience in the market or maybe they even have some experience with you uh, closing on past transactions and they'll lobby for whoever they think is most likely to close to the seller. And that will be again, the round where you'll put together a finalized offer, uh, potentially a little bit closer to the seller's uh, asking price. Then you get a word of the deal if you are the winning bid. Absolutely. So when this occurs, obviously, we are very excited that we were the chosen ones for the deal, especially if we're, uh, you know, maybe three in the best and final. So at this point, it's only the beginning. Uh, there's still a lot of work left over for this, but this is a portion where it goes to the PSA or the purchase and sale agreement. Uh, this is a contract between the seller and the buyer. And we strongly advise everyone to make sure that they hire a qualified real estate attorney, or they also um, are noted as transactional attorneys, uh, in order to help you draft this PSA, because it is a binding uh, contract that has to be uh, adhered to once both the seller and the buyer execute this document. So this PSA formalizes pretty much all the, the terms and all the initial agreements laid out in the letter of intent in the beginning. Uh, but it goes through obviously a lot greater depth and greater detail uh, in this document. It's a pretty lengthy document. So this is why we 100% advise you to hire a real estate attorney for that. Uh, once this is completed and it's executed, your property is now under contract. So congratulations. Yeah, so you're under contract and immediately the clock starts for the due diligence period. Um, that due diligence period is typically a 30-day period where you have access to the building and any financial documents that the seller is able to provide. Uh, and you'll use that time to verify your initial underwriting and make sure that the deal still makes sense in light of uh, further information that you're able to get, both by doing your on-site inspections, having maybe your property manager walk units with you, potentially bringing in contractors and handymen through the property with you, uh, and then also digging into some of the financial reporting that you'll get from the seller. 
you want to take full advantage of that time period to do your physical and financial due diligence because your earnest money deposit, that's typically 1% of the purchase price, it's going to go hard. Meaning if beyond the due diligence period, you back out of the deal, you're going to lose that money after that period. So um, you, you want to really make sure that this deal still makes sense in light of all this new information. Um, as GPs, as general partners on a particular deal, our role basically boils down to risk management. Due diligence and the due diligence period is a big part of that. The more comprehensive our due diligence is, the less hidden surprises and risks that there are that we may find out about post takeover. You're trying to limit the amount of risk during this period that you have when you take on the property. You really have to take that period seriously because again, there's a lot to do within 30 days. Um, if you're looking for further information on this, we highly suggest reading Brian Hennessy's book on due diligence and commercial real estate. We've had the uh, fortune to have Brian on our webinar uh, in the past, and we'll link to that webinar in the notes of this video. The next portion uh, part of this video that I want to talk about is something that we really uh, take very seriously. And the first part of it is the physical due diligence, just as, part, as important as the financial due diligence, we'll, which Mark will discuss next. So the physical due diligence is literally uh, boots on the ground, being there, seeing the property, inspecting all aspects of the property, obviously with your professionals, with your vendors that you're going to be hiring, bringing on board for a couple of days and going through uh, all the issues that um, the property may have. So uh, what the physical due diligence incorporates really a um, the property inspection itself, so the actual site the buildings, the interiors, that's typically performed by a property inspector that uh, thoroughly documents uh, any issues that they find. That is a pretty lengthy report and something that you should definitely be reviewing uh, after it's completed and generated by that professional. The next one is something that uh, we also uh, hear a lot of other syndicators really do is the sewer scope and inspection. So one uh, little tidbit of advice for folks is that to make sure that before the sewer scope or the sewer work is actually physically done on site, a week or two before, you wanna make sure you reach out to your local utility authority of the city that you're operating in and try to see if you can pull as built information of your sewer line. So that stuff is typically uh, obtained from them. It's free of charge. You just have to fill out an application. They'll email you a PDF of it. And that document, what that's gonna show you is that where your sewer lines are located on your property and where potential laterals that come from your building and connect to your sewer line. The other item is obviously the roof, get a, a roofer out there that you know and trust that can give you some insights, some uh, points as to some items that may need to be repaired. The other item is structural. So if you feel that there are some serious structural issues that have been brought up by the home inspector, you may want to hire a structural engineer to go out and give you a maybe a second report that really is more detailed to the structural aspect of the of the um, of the of the structure itself of the building. Um, in, in the case that you do have structural issues with the property, um, there are other trades, other contractors such as MEPs, uh, mechanical electrical plumbing, and those folks will help you identify the age, the uh, the make, the models of your condenser systems of your. Uh, hot water heaters, your mechanical HPC systems, because typically those are very high cost items to replace. So you want to make sure the age of them and make sure they're incorporated in your CapEx budget. Uh, by getting this information, you're going to be a lot more prepared. The, the other um, uh, item that we typically try to do is tenant interviews. So it's really good to, once you're kind of like visiting the inside of some of these units, it's, it's talk to your tenants. Um, find out what issues they're uh, dealing with on the property. Uh, do they deal with a lot of water issues? Things like that are going to help you as a potential owner later on identify uh, with the tenant uh, by finding out these things. CapEx, budget, and scope. Again, I talked about a little bit. This physical due diligence is really going to allow you to tighten up that CapEx budget and scope as you move forward. So the next portion is the mystery shopping, which we love to do that uh, allows us to, uh, a little bit more of an insight on comparable properties similar to yours in the area. So that's the physical due diligence. That's our process of trying to verify and ascertain all of the risks involved with the physical structure itself. Now we're gonna move on to financial due diligence, which is equally as important. And that's an examination of the financials that the seller provides you at the beginning of the due diligence period. You're looking through documents like the T12, which is a 12 month income statement. You're looking at the rent roll, which is gonna show what tenants are currently being charged as well as when leases expire. 
You're going to be looking at the CapEx history. That is what the seller has done in his ownership of the property. You're going to do a lease audit, meaning what do their leases uh, include? What do they exclude? Um, you're going to have to know this because once you take over, these are going to become your tenants. And so you have to be really comfortable with what's agreed to in those leases. You're going to look at delinquencies. So things like uh, if tenants are not paying, uh, which tenants are those, how long it's been since they've paid. Um, that's all stuff that you want to know going into, you know, ownership of these properties, as well as accounts payable and accounts receivables. Wow. You're also going to examine big bank statements and compare those to the seller's financials to verify that what they're telling you is accurate. You're also going to look at things like the existing service contracts. That's for vendors like your landscapers, your pest control, your waste management companies. And you want to examine those service contracts to make sure that they can you can cancel them upon takeover if you have another vendor that you want to work with. You're going to be re-quoting those expenses from existing vendors that you're comfortable doing business with. You're also going to examine the insurance policy that the owner has relative to the insurance that you're looking to carry. You want to carry both business owners policy on the property as well as umbrella insurance. Um, and you want to be working with a qualified professional, just like with the real estate attorney that Gonzalo mentioned, a qualified professional is going to help you limit the amount of risk that you're taking when you take over the asset. And then finally, you want to call the local county tax assessor's office because you want to understand how taxes work when there's a reassessment and how it's calculated upon your takeover. The last thing that you want is to take over a property and the following year get hit with a huge tax increase that you didn't budget for. So calling those individuals and understanding when you're going to get reassessed is vital. Finally, you're going to be working with your property manager and drafting an operating budget and business plan for the property. They're going to be your eyes and ears on the property. So you want to make sure that they're comfortable with the business plan uh, upon takeover. So now once you've done your physical and financial due diligence, you're going to start immediately with the capital raise. Capital raising is vital to a deal because you need capital to be able to close on the property. The capital raise portion of doing any deal starts well before you even have a deal under contract. The idea that you're going to find a good deal and the money will come is absolutely bogus. And we call BS on that in our experience. Nobody likes making investments or financial decisions under time pressure. And that's definitely the case if you haven't had preliminary discussions with investors to educate them on how syndication works. We get asked all the time, do we start with the deal or the money? And our answer is resoundingly, start with capital raising efforts first and then find the deal. Start reaching out to your investors, your audience now so that you can tell them what you're doing and educate them on passive real estate investing through syndications. And that way, when you do have a deal, you'll be well-prepared and they'll be very comfortable with the opportunity in, in front of them. So besides capital raising, another aspect that starts well before that you have a actual deal under contract is financing. You wanna form relationships with lenders well before you ever have a deal under contract. The lender is your biggest partner after all on any given deal. They're gonna give you anywhere from 60 to 80% generally of a particular deal. So you have to start forming those relationships immediately. Have conversations with local lenders, learn about different loan programs, and that'll help you be a better underwriter and match the corresponding debt with the best deal. The next part is third party reports. And these are typically obtained either by you or the lender. Some of these items include survey of the property, environmental reports such as phase ones, appraisals of the property, property inspection reports, and uh, title commitments. So we've touched upon a lot of the items that you're going to be doing in the first 30 days of due diligence. Once those 30 days of due diligence are expended, you're going to have 30 days typically, depending on how your contract is written, to close the deal. You may have to negotiate for extensions in this period should unforeseen issues arise. The lender drags their feet. You encounter some things you didn't know about with the property. Um, but during that period is when you're going to want to set up the ownership entity and the bank account for the property. You're also going to work on the capital funding portions. And now is the part where you want to put pen to paper. Investors will have a chance to log on to your investor portal, look at your investor deck. Maybe they might be able to attend a webinar that you put on with the general partners, introducing the opportunity in more depth. You're also going to provide them with legal docs. If it is a syndication, you're going to have things like a PPM, a private placement memorandum, a subscription booklet, as well as the operating agreement for the entity in which they're going to be buying ownership. Finally, you're going to have them wire money once all the legal documents are signed, and you're going to confirm those money orders with investors. Now, coming up until closing, you, you may have some last-minute lender requests. These are normal. They always happen. It's always part of any deal. So you're going to want to make sure that you have enough time to satisfy any last-minute lender requirements during that period. 
You're also going to coordinate with the PM, the property manager, on their transition upon takeover if it is a new property manager that you're bringing on. They're going to want to reach out to tenants and notify them that they're going to be taking over. And they're going to want to also onboard those tenants onto their property management portal to make sure that payments can be made on time post takeover. They're also going to be closing day. They're going to be doing closing day walkthroughs. The last thing that you want is go through the entire closing process and then take over and suddenly you find out that something is missing or that what you saw during your due diligence period is no longer the case because you didn't walk the units on closing day. You're gonna to wanna to check for things like personal property and equipment, PP&E, make sure that anything that was agreed to and laid out in the contract as far as appliances and otherwise are actually left at the property for you upon takeover. So congratulations. If you have completed all the steps above, you found the deal, you put it under contract, you complete your due diligence, you raise the capital, and now you finally have closed. Congrats. You and your investors are now a proud owner of a multifamily asset. Now, this is only where the fun begins and really where all the hard work starts is at the day of closing, is the asset management portion. And that's really where the um, the uh, rubber meets the road, to, so to say, is where really um, the business plan gets executed. And on uh, next month's video, we're going to be diving a little bit deeper into this topic and how asset management is really the engine that drives the profits of your business plan. So like we always like to say here at Maple Capital Partners, be kind, be charitable and invest wisely. We'll see you next time.